start. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Are listening to one the Astro Welcome back to the Astro I'm your host, Rue. Today is Tuesday, July 16th, 2024. We are well within half a moon and on our way to full. I hope all of you have been wonderful. I hope you've all been uh, getting some clear nights out. I know I haven't been getting too many myself, but that is how it goes. Just going to let this uh, fade out for us here. There we go. So what is new with everybody? I hope everybody's been well. I've been uh, working quite a bit. I actually got into a new role at my job, which is quite nice. I am a uh, hard worker in the IT industry when I'm not doing astronomy, and I recently received a promotion. So I was uh, quite happy about that and figured I'd share that with you guys. Uh, Outside of that, uh, I have been quite lucky to do some astronomy this week. In fact, last night we had... I think our first clear skies in about two weeks in Charlotte. Um, Unfortunately, we've had a lot of clouds this summer, as I'm sure lots of folks on the East Coast of North America have been experiencing. And then you got wildfires out West from what I've been uh, hearing from various individuals. So no one seems to be having a perfect summer, but that's how it goes. We take advantage of when we can and, you know, we do the best we can. So that's that is all we can do. Um, I got the Rokinon 135 out last night. I had the L Extreme Duo Narrow Band ah, Duo Narrow Band <laughs> filter um, installed, and I was imaging at f 2.8, doing 180 second exposures on the North America Nebula region, and that's a really great target at that focal length because. You're able to get the entire North American nebula and then lots of the surrounding nebulosity. And I think that's the Cygnus wall right there is how they refer to it, if I'm not mistaken, is right in that vicinity. And then you have what I like to refer to as the, uh, well, actually, I take that back. My wife actually first referred to as the puppy dog nebula, which is uh, on the right hand side of the North American nebula. If you ever stretch it really hard and kind of tilt it a certain way. You can see what looks like the silhouette of a dog's face, which is very, very cool. Couple other cool things in the news for the Astrocast is we actually have some new audio equipment. You might be noticing a much higher quality sound. After last week's debacle with the uh, crackling noises every five or six minutes in the audio, I was pretty much fed up. Um, I pride myself on having very good, clean audio for the show. I know that it's not fun to listen to a podcast that isn't good to your ears. So we do have some new equipment, new microphone, and I actually went with a Rode Duocaster for a podcast. So it got a new mixing board basically. So no longer using USB microphones. We are now on XLR. That means a whole lot of things. It makes uh, much easier for interviews, for one thing, because I can bring in a secondary XLR mic and not have to rely solely on those DJI wireless mics when we do interviews. Not that they're terrible quality, because they're not, uh, but this will allow us to have wonderful quality all the time. So I am quite excited about that. Something else you might notice is that we are not doing video this week. Uh, That's not by design. I just didn't have enough time to put together a video this week. And like I said, guys, this is still going to predominantly be an audio podcast. Uh, But when I do have the time available and when it makes sense, I will certainly be doing a video version of the podcast. Uh, That being said, this probably would be a pretty decent week to do a video podcast, but I don't think it's going to be necessary, to be frank, because we are going to be talking about calibration frames today. I know I've been talking about having that discussion with you guys for several weeks now, and I kind of feel like 
after today, I went through and updated my Darks library, and I will explain to you what that is shortly here. Uh, I thought it would be a good time to have that conversation while I have, uh, you know, calibration frames on the mind. So what are calibration frames first? Uh, well, let's answer that question. So calibration frames are photos that we take with our camera or astronomy camera, or whatever you have to basically ensure that our end result photo looks as good as possible. Now, calibration frames aren't necessary. You can get away with just doing light frames. And in some cases, it can actually come out quite nice. Uh, if you actually look around at various YouTubers, there are quite a few that only use light frames. And I'll explain the difference between a light and a dark frame shortly here. But basically, uh, they get away with doing it without any dark frames, flat frames, or bias frames, and they're very happy with the results of their photos. Now, there are times when things like flat frames and dark frames can become absolutely crucial to making your photo look good, and that is going to very much depend on what kind of equipment you are using and basically how it's running and if you have very clean glass and then a few other factors that will... Uh, get into as we talk about this. So let's start with the very first type of frame. That would be a light frame. So essentially a light frame is just the image that you take with your telescope or camera. So it has light in the frame and that is why we call it a light frame. Pretty simple, um, but light frames uh, can vary a little bit depending on uh, what your setup is. Obviously you can have different lengths of light frame you could do five second lights, you could do 30 second lights. Uh, like I did last night, you could do 180 second lights. And that's just basically gonna determine how much signal you get in each of your photos. So in astrophotography, obviously we stack our photos one on top of the other. Um, if you are new to astrophotography or you don't know how the process works, basically what an astrophotographer does is he will take a lot of exposures of the same target in the night sky. So let's say, for example, last night I was taking three minute exposures of the North American nebula. And as we gather the photons of light on our camera sensor, it builds up signal and signal is data in our case, ones and zeros essentially. And we continue to get new photons hitting our sensor the longer that that camera shutter is open. So your eyeball might see, you know, one sixtieth of a second. And I'm just throwing a number out there. I don't I actually had a discussion with somebody last week about how many frames per second the human eye sees. And that's a topic for another day. But the reason that you can't see these nebula with your naked eye is because your eye only exposes, so to say, for a very short period of time. It is very sensitive and it's very well equipped for the human experience, but if your eye could expose for, let's say, 30 seconds instead of the split second that it does, you would be able to see many of the nebula and galaxy that are in our night sky if you were to go to a very dark area with your naked eye. But since you can't do that, what we do as astrophotographers is we use our cameras and they do the same for us. So a light frame is essentially one exposure from a camera of a varying length. So we can pretty much leave it at that. Um, now, there are a lot of different things to keep in mind about your light frames. Chief among them is noise. So noise is kind of the enemy of all astrophotographers. Noise is basically the uh, grainy type of uh, well, grain that you get in your images whenever you are shooting at either a high ISO or maybe it's uh, dark out. If you've ever tried to take a photo with your cell phone at night of, let's say, your friends while you're out to dinner or something, and then you didn't use flash and you looked at the photo and you noticed it looked really grainy, that's noise. So... Since as astrophotographers, we're shooting images of the night sky, we are obviously combating lots of noise because it is very dark out. Now, there's a lot of things that we can do 
to help reduce and eliminate that noise. Chief among them is what we call integration time. So your integration time is your overall length of total exposures when added up. So let's take my uh, example from last night. I took 30 images that were three minutes long each of the North American Nebula. So that gives me an integration time of 90 minutes. So in total, I have 90 minutes of exposure in this one photo. Now, one of the first things you may ask yourself is why would you stack the same, essentially the same photo 30 times? Why not just take one three minute photo and then copy and paste it 30 times and then stack those on top of each other? Well, the answer is what we were talking about earlier when I was talking about photons hitting your light sensor. So these are different photons that are coming into your camera, not the same ones over and over again. And since we're getting different photons, we're actually getting different pieces of light, if you will, different signal that is coming from space into our camera. And when we add all those up, that is how we get an overall beautiful image. And the more integration time that we have, the less noise that we have, because the less noise that you have, the more signal you have, the more signal you build up, the less noise that you have. So signal is data, noise is bad, and we basically accumulate as much signal as possible to reduce the noise to a point where it is completely negligible. Ideally, you know, if you were making an astronomy photo that you wanted to really look nice and do a large print of, most astronomers and astrophotographers will probably tell you that you need to get, you know, at least eight hours of exposure time. I personally find that with today's modern tools, that is not necessarily the case. Uh, I oftentimes from a dark sky location can get away with just doing an hour or two hours and being very happy with the end results. Uh, luckily for us, we have a lot of tools in this day and age that we can use to bring out the signal a bit more, to reduce the noise. Uh, if you use a program like PixInsight, which is kind of the gold standard for astrophotography pro uh, processing, uh, it actually has tools built into it such as, uh, well, not built into it, but tools that you can purchase like Blur Exterminator. Uh, noise exterminator, and those can basically help reduce your noise and improve the overall quality of your image. That being said, uh, we like to say that there is uh, no substitute for dark skies and there is no substitute for integration time. So ideally, if you want to get the highest quality image possible, you're going to want to spend as much time as you reasonably can within any given target. Now, there is a very large caveat to everything that I just said, and that is all integration time is not created equal. This is something I actually heard on a Dark Rangers YouTube channel. Uh, they're an excellent channel if you ever want to check them out. I'm actually going to link to the video that actually inspired this episode um, in the show notes if you would like to check it out. And uh, what I mean by that is depending on your setup and your specific conditions of where you're imaging, you may need significantly less or in some cases significantly more time. And I'm going to give you an example. So from my home here in Matthews, North Carolina, I live in a Bortle 7 sky zone. And a 7 is not very good. The scale goes from 1 to 9. I've been saying one to 10 for a long time, but I think I've read that it's actually one to nine technically. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with one to nine and uh, seven is on the higher end of the scale, which is not good. So if I am uh, imaging from a seven for one hour, and then I drive to, let's say the observatory down in South Carolina, and I'm imaging in the uh, Bortle four skies for the same one hour, I'm going to gather a lot more signal in that one hour because I don't have to contend with nearly as much light pollution. Now, all that being said, there is another factor that goes on top of that, and that is what is your aperture? So depending on what the aperture is of either the lens or telescope that you are using, 
it's going to determine exactly how much light you are able to gather with, uh, you know, any given integration time. So for example, uh, the Rokinon lens that I was shooting with last night is an extremely fast F2 lens. So it gathers light extremely quickly, but my 80 millimeter doublet telescope that, uh, you know, I get closer up views with, unfortunately it is F 5.6. So it takes a lot more time to gather just as much data as my F2 telescope or camera lens does. Now, if we wanted to get really technical, we could actually go over the uh, specific equations that explain exactly how f-stops work. And we actually would use a concept of uh, the amount light gathered is inversely proportional to the square root of the f number. I'm not going to get into the specifics for that, but I will post the equation for you in the notes if you wanted to give it a uh, look and just you know calculate exactly how long one of your scopes would take versus you know another one uh, but needless to say that f2 scope so let's say that we are imaging at f2 and then the other scope is f5.6 one hour on the f2 scope is going to basically equate to nearly eight hours on the f5.6 scope so if I were to gather data on any specific nebula for over eight hours on my big telescope, I could get that exact same amount of signal in just one hour on the Rokinon lens. So when you're purchasing a telescope, these are some of the things that can be important. So, it, you know, a more expensive astrograph that has a faster uh, F ratio of, say, F4 might you know be a lot more expensive than a doublet telescope like I have that is f5.6. While you're spending a little bit more money though, you're going to save a lot of time because you're going to be able to gather a whole lot more light much faster than you would with that same uh, f5.6 telescope. So uh, there are a lot of other factors as well that go into f-stops. Um, particularly when you get into the very, very long focal length uh, telescopes because you actually want to have a higher f-stop number at that point to, you know, uh, minimize distortion in the optics because, you know, the faster your lens or telescope is, the more susceptible it is to any sort of uh, distortion or basically all of your gear has to be very exacting and a wider field of view is easier to do that with at a higher f-stop. Whereas if you get a very zoomed in view, you know, a thousand millimeters to 3000 millimeters, generally speaking, you're going to see somewhere in the F10 range. And you see that a lot with like Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes, which uh, Celestron is very famous for making. Now Celestron also makes a uh, awesome, well, they make an accessory, but the most popular one is called the Hyperstar that you can combine with their Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes uh, to get kind of the best of both worlds with that really long focal length. But if you put this reducer on it, you get an F2 scope. So you get both a really long focal length F10 scope for shooting very distant galaxies, or you can get a much shorter focal length F2 scope for sucking in light on larger nebulas. If you want to uh, hear more about that, we actually went quite in depth on that topic on episode 17. So feel free to uh, look through the back catalog if you'd like to hear more about that particular setup. All right, so that covers light frames pretty well. Why don't we start talking about dark frames? Because dark frames, in my opinion, are pretty much your most important calibration frames. They do a whole lot of different things for you, uh, but most importantly, they give you a nice even background and they eliminate any hot pixels that you may have, as well as amp glow, which is a problem with not so much newer uh, astrophotography cameras, but it's extremely common on anything that's I would say more than two or three years old at this point. I suppose most of the newer astrophotography cameras have pretty much eliminated amp, eliminated amp glow at this point, but it's still very much a real issue for the you know vast majority of people who own 
an astrophotography camera that may be, you know, two or three years old, or perhaps you buy, you know, a slightly cheaper model and it's a little bit older. Therefore you have to deal with amp glow. So amp glow is just basically a signal that comes in through your sensor whenever it warms up and you end up getting a glowing white light off of the side of your sensor. And unfortunately this can bleed into your light frames over time. And if you don't have dark frames, you're not able to remove it. And that obviously is very crucial if you do have amp glow. So you pretty much have to deal with dark frames at that point. So that being said, if you have one of the newer astrophotography cameras, such as the ASI 585 MC Pro, which is uh, ZWO's newer uh, budget astrophotography cooled camera, um, they actually do not have amp glow. In fact, a lot of the newer astrophotography cameras don't have this problem. But there are other reasons that you want to use uh, dark frames besides just removing amp glow. Chief among them would probably be just the fact that it reduces noise. So your camera sensors actually do generate noise when they heat up during long exposures. And even your Cooled cameras, though significantly less, uh, can still suffer from this to some degree. Uh, you also have hot pixels. So a hot pixel is basically when your sensor completely warms up after taking long exposures. You may essentially encounter what is a stuck pixel on your sensor, or it could even be a hot pixel that is always on and not necessarily something that's warming up, but it's just always there whenever you're exposing. If you take a dark frame and then you use it when you're you know, stacking your images together, then your processing software is gonna say, okay, we know that we don't wanna show whatever that one hot pixel is in the final product. So the darks will essentially subtract that from your final image. And essentially by doing all of this, it reduces random noise and it takes out the hot pixels. And essentially you end up with an improved signal to noise ratio. And you just basically get a clearer and more detailed image at the end of the day, especially if you're dealing with very faint objects, they can become much more visible. So if you're dealing with like really weak oxygen signal, for example, dark frames are a great thing to have because they're going to let you stretch your data just a little bit more while still being able to keep those nice uh, dark backgrounds that we strive for. And also, again, not have to deal with noise from hot pixels. Now, let's talk about when you need to take dark frames. And this is going to vary depending on what type of camera you have. And it is honestly one of the biggest reasons why most people who really get into astrophotography end up buying a cooled astronomy camera. With a cooled astrophotography camera, we can actually store dark frames for months at a time and reuse them over and over again. And the reason for that is because we are able to cool the sensor to the same temperature each time we use it, we don't have to worry about our camera being at a different temperature the next time that we go out because, again, we can cool it down to, let's say, minus 10 or minus 20 below ambient temperature, and therefore the dark becomes usable over and over again because we're able to maintain that consistent cooled temperature. Whereas something like a DSLR or a mirrorless camera that doesn't have cooling built into it, you're going to have to take dark frames every night. So every time you go out, you're going to have a different temperature that you're dealing with. Your camera is going to, you know, get hot to different degrees depending on what time of year it is, you know, uh, how humid it is. All sorts of factors go into determining what the temperature is going to be on your sensor uh, for a DSLR or mirrorless camera. And you have to take that into account when you're making dark frames. Because if I were to, let's say, go out with my mirrorless camera on a nice uh, spring evening when it's, let's just say, 65 degrees, and then a month later I go out and it's warmed up significantly and it's 80 degrees, you have a uh, you know 15 degree difference between 
when you last took images with that camera and the, you know, warmer night where you're at 80 degrees and that is not going to allow you to use the darks because they're going to end up looking weird on your final photo when you stack it because the temperatures aren't going to match. The noise is going to be different, yada, yada, yada. Um, it's not a good time. So the, the great thing though, again, about having that cooled astrophotography camera is you can actually build a library of darks at your, you know, leisure, however you like to do it. For example, uh, this morning, I, it's been, I guess, probably three months since I got new darks for my Rokinon, um, set. And most people say you can keep uh, dark frames up to six months. I tend to do them every season just because, you know, as the temperatures change, I think it's pretty reasonable um, to go ahead and update my dark library. So I basically went into my ASI Air. I selected darks. I set 180 seconds because, again, that is how long the light that I took last night was. Um I guess I haven't actually mentioned that yet. So darks always need to be the same length as your light frames. That is very, very crucial. Um, whenever you go to take your dark frames, you can put your lens cap back on. Um, if you have an astronomy camera, you can put it in a dark drawer and shut the drawer. Um, but whatever you do, um, you want to make sure that you take the dark frames at the exact same settings that the light frames were taken at. Um, so let's talk about the word dark for a moment, because I realize I've been talking about dark frames and haven't explained what makes them dark frames. Uh, what makes them dark frames is basically the fact that you don't see anything in the image because you, again, are covering up the sensor. So with a DSLR camera, what most people will do is just put the lens cap on the camera. And then ideally, you're going to either obviously be out in the field. Um, hopefully it's nighttime out. You put that lens cap on and then you're not going to have any light leaking into your darks, which can cause issues. So you do want to get it as dark as possible when you are uh, taking your darks um, with a cool astronomy camera. Since we don't have to be, you know, out in the field while we're taking the photos, we can, again, take them whenever we want. So what a lot of people will do is they will have like a uh, special cabinet that they'll put their camera into. I've actually seen people put them in the freezer to take darks. I personally feel like that's overkill and just asking for trouble. I don't see any advantage to getting your camera that cold for taking darks. Um, but if you really want to risk that, knock yourself out. Uh, I don't recommend it again. Um, but anyway, uh, the point being, put the lens cap on either your lens or the you know uh, lens cap on your telescope. And then you're going to take your dark frames at the exact same ISO, the same gain, and the same length of shutter time as you did for your light frames. And if you want to try different light uh, time exposures with a cooled astronomy camera, one of the big advantages is, again, when you're building up that dark library, like today I took 30 180 second dark frames. And then when I was done with that, I took 30 60 second dark frames because there are times when I'm using my F2 Rokinon lens that a three minute exposure will just blow everything out because that's taking in so much light and I need to reduce it to 60 seconds when that happens. So this way I have the library of darks for both cases, depending on how and what I'm imaging. Now, I know I kind of said this before, but I do want to reiterate it for anyone who uses a DSLR or mirrorless camera it is very important that you take new darks every time that you are out taking new photos. Because again, the temperature won't be the same if you wait till tomorrow and you're at home and you're sitting in the bedroom and you put the lens cap on and decide to take your darks then. Uh, it's not to say you couldn't get away with it, but you are not going to end up with the highest quality image possible. Um, so whenever possible, you know, absolutely take new dark frames while you're out in the field. And it gives you something to look forward to when you get that cool astronomy camera, you'll be able to build up your library of darts. And that's something that you can do when it's cloudy out sometimes. Well, not sometimes lately, but when I first got my cool astronomy camera, the 294 MC Pro, which was my first one, 
Um, it was something fun to do in the evenings when it was cloudy out. I, you know, could build my dark library and that way I was actually doing something astronomy related when I uh, couldn't actually go out and see the stars. Now, how many dark frames do you want? Uh, this is going to vary a little bit depending on who you ask, but I would recommend between 20 and 30. That is generally what I would aim for. And that goes for pretty much all calibration frames. Uh, we're about to talk about flats and bias frames. Uh, before we do that, though, I would like to mention that generally speaking, you want to match up the amount of frames that you use for each of these. So, for example, if I were to use 30 dark frames, then ideally I would also use 30 flat frames and 30 bias frames. You don't have to do this, but I find that it's good practice. Um, I have had situations where I've had 30 dark frames, but I only had time to take 10 flat frames because the sky was getting too bright. Um, and that's okay. You can absolutely get away with doing that. It's better to have 10 flat frames than no flat frames for sure. Um, but anytime that you can, try to get an even amount of each. So lights, darks, flats, and bias. You're going to want to uh, try to get those even. So what are flat frames? So flat frames are actually very, very, very important. Um, some people would argue they're actually more important than dark frames. I kind of come down in the middle. I find them evenly important, uh, darks and flats. Um, so flat frames serve two main purposes. First of all, they remove any vignetting that you have on your lens. Vignetting is essentially darker areas towards the corner of your image. And it is caused because your sensor is not able to, or your lens is not able to fully illuminate the sensor that you are recording with. And this can be for a lot of different reasons. It can be because it's a large aperture. It can be because it's a really fast F-stop. It can be, uh, like I say, a whole lot of different reasons. But vignetting is extremely common in astronomy and astrophotography. And if you have vignetting, by far the easiest way to reduce and completely eliminate it is to take flat frames. So what does a flat frame look like? Well, it should be uniform and consistent. You're basically looking to get a white light of frame that is evenly lit across the entire frame. And you can do this by a lot of different ways. Um, I personally use what is called a flat panel. And you can get really expensive, fancy flat panels that basically evenly light up a uh, thin plastic light, essentially, that you can set on top of your telescope or you can mount them to the walls. A lot of people who have observatories actually mount a permanent flat panel to the wall that they can remotely control. Um, but I just have a basically a tracing pad from Amazon that I got for about 20 bucks. And that is extremely common to use. Um, I feel that it works really well. I sometimes will use the white t-shirt method in conjunction with, uh, that, uh, tracing pad. Sorry, I forgot what I called it. Uh, the flat panel essentially. Um, and the white t-shirt method is basically taking a white, uh, or any, you know, white material it doesn't necessarily have to be a t-shirt. It just needs to be an even stretchy white, uniformly translucent material. Uh, t-shirt's always best because it's just easy. And you actually put that over your scope and then you put, you know, the light source on top of it. And that helps basically just disperse the light evenly to make sure that it's not too bright in any given spot. Um, you can also actually use the t-shirt method to point up at the sky and take what's called sky flats. So if, for example, you've been out all night imaging and the sun is coming up and it's bright enough out, you can put that uh, t-shirt over the front of your lens, point it up at the sky, and then take your flats uh, by just using the natural skylight around you or sunlight, obviously. Um, the ideal flat frame uh, the exposure is going to vary a little bit, and it's actually something that you kind of need to calculate while you're in the field. And once you get a feel for your camera and you know how long it takes to get a flat frame, it'll be very, very quick and easy for you to do. Um, but what you want to do is basically get your histogram, 
which is a tool within your camera. Um, you can, if you have an ASI air, your histograms at the bottom, it's that number that goes from zero up to, I think 60,000 or so. I guess it depends on your camera, but the histogram basically shows the black signal on one side and the white signal on the other side. And what you're trying to do is get the little hump in the middle about halfway through the histogram to where that's considered an even flat frame exposure. Um, how long the frame is, is going to wildly vary from camera to camera. It's also going to vary depending on what ISO you set. If you're using like a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. Um, I will say that you always want to use the same ISO that you used in your light frames. You'll notice a uh, common theme amongst uh, calibration frames is that you always keep your ISO the same. There will never be any changing of the ISO. Sometimes you'll change the exposure length. Uh, like I say, dark frames are going to be the same exposure length as your light frames, but flat frames will not be the same exposure length because you only need to expose for maybe one second to get that histogram, you know, right in the middle, which is what you're going to aim for. With my 294 MC Pro, I actually have to get it over two seconds. It's a quirky feature of the 294. The flats don't come out good unless you get at least two seconds of exposure. Uh, but I would think generally speaking, if you have a t-shirt over your lens or scope, and then you're using either, like I say, a flat panel, like I described, or you could even use a tablet and just set a white background on it and then set that on top of your telescope or your lens. Um, somewhere between half a second and two seconds is generally going to give you a good flat frame. So I would start at half a second and then check your histogram and if it's a little bit farther to the left than the middle, then just increase your exposure time a little bit. If it's all the way to the right, then decrease your exposure time a little bit. And once you get it to where it's right about in the middle, then just remember those settings and take 30 flat frames because we took 30 dark frames. Now we're going to take 30 flat frames. And the other thing it's going to do besides remove vignetting and this is very, very important, is it's going to remove dust that may have appeared on your lens or on your sensor, um, anywhere in your imaging train, basically, where dust can appear, a flat is going to help you get rid of. There are times when flats can't completely eliminate dust, depending on how bad it is. But if you're like me, you generally keep your glass fairly clean. I try to wipe it down on a regular basis. Not like every single time I go out, but I keep uh, microfiber cloths around to wipe down my lenses. And then uh, the actual sensors, I don't clean those very often, but I am very careful and never leave them exposed any longer than they absolutely have to be. So uh, flat frames though, if you get dust, um, you know, falling on your a telescope throughout the night, or maybe you kept it in your garage and left the cap off like maybe I have a couple of times, then the flat frames are going to save you because if you didn't have them and let's say, let's say you imaged all night long in the winter, eight hours long, and you were imaging, I don't know, let's just say the Horsehead Nebula, you were trying to get a really awesome picture of the Horsehead Nebula and you realized later on while you were processing the images that you had some scattered dust on your camera lens, if you didn't take flat frames, you're going to have a really hard time getting rid of that from your image. But if you took the two minutes to take flat frames that you should have, then you are not going to have to worry about that dust. You can just laugh and say, ah, I got flat frames. They're going to cancel that out. Same thing goes for vignetting, like I mentioned earlier. And, you know, particularly with fast lenses, if you're using something like a Rokinon F2, which is a very common uh, astrophotography lens like I have, um, vignetting is always going to be present in the really uh, fast exposures of F2 or F2.8. Um, so that'll just help you eliminate that. So, uh, I will give a shout out to dark dragons astronomy. 
they actually have a really cool flat panel app for the iPad. So if you're an Apple user and you actually own an iPad, uh, well, you don't have to go out and buy a tracing pad. Lucky for you, they already made the app that does everything for you. So definitely check that out. I will leave a uh, link to the Dark Dragons flat panel app in the uh, description of the show. So if that's something that you're interested, uh, go ahead and give that a look and make sure to leave them a review and tell them that the Astrocast sent you if you do that. They're really good friends of the show. I know uh, both of them very well. Uh, they started their company a couple of years ago and they're just doing awesome, awesome stuff now. So just wanted to uh, give a shout out to our friends over there at Dark Dragons. All right. And after we are done with flat frames, we talk about bias frames. Now, Bias frames can vary a little bit. Some people will refer to bias frames as dark flats or flat darks. Um, they're actually two different things because technically a bias uh, frame is going to be taking an exposure at basically the shortest possible duration. So for like a mirrorless camera, that would generally be like your one four thousandths of a second. Um, and then in the ASI Air, you're going to basically turn down your shutter speed to as low as it can go. Same goes for Nina if you're using that or whatever astronomy software that you're using. Um, you will have your lens cap uh, or telescope cap on while you're taking bias frames. They are essentially like very short dark frames. Um, that's exactly what they are, in fact. And the whole purpose is basically to capture the readout noise of your camera sensor. So that is basically electronic noise that the camera generates whenever it uh, reads signal from the sensor. Um, and bias frames are going to help you eliminate this so you don't have to worry about any of that sensor noise showing up in your light frames. So uh, again, you want to keep your ISO the same as your light frames. So we're going to see that like we always do. And then, as I said earlier, just uh, set the exposure time to your shortest possible duration, whatever that is, depending on which camera you are using. And then take just as many bias frames as you did light frames and dark frames. In fact, with bias frames, some people actually suggest taking significantly more. They say that it can actually create a more accurate noise profile. I don't know that I've actually experienced that in my usage, but you know, that's not to say that it's not true. So if you want to take more bias frames, absolutely feel free to, you know, you could take 50 to a hundred. They're very, very quick. So it's not like you have to wait around very long uh, for it to take them. Um, so it certainly wouldn't hurt to capture more bias frames if you wanted to. All right. And then finally, we have our dark flat frames or flat darks, some people call them. So the difference between a bias and a dark flat frame is that your bias frame basically exposes at the fastest possible exposure time of your camera, whereas your flat darks or dark flats are going to, you guessed it, have the same exposure time as your flat frames. So if you remember earlier, we were talking about flat frames. I said, you know, anywhere from half a second to two seconds is generally going to be, you know, good to get you to halfway through your histogram uh, while you're pointing at that white light. Um, well, while you're doing your dark flats, you would take whatever that length was to get you to that perfect halfway point and you would just put your cap on your telescope or your lens and then take that exact same length exposure 30 times or, you know, you could take more. Um, honestly, with this one, this isn't one where you're going to want to add in more like you would with the bias frame. So let's just stick with 30 on the uh, flat darks. And it's essentially going to do pretty much the same thing as a bias frame from what I understand. It basically just ensures accurate noise profiling uh, for your sensor. Um, some cameras work better with flat darks and some cameras work better with bias. I don't know that I've seen any instance where you need to have both. Um, so if you're using flat darks, you don't need to worry about bias frames. And if you're using bias frames, you don't need to worry about flat darks. Some cameras, um, and you'll have to read up specifically on your camera, work better with one or the other. 
Uh, for example, my 294 MC Pro very much needs uh, flat darks instead of bias frames. Um, it just seems to work better and give me uh, overall better images when I use flat darks. So um, yeah, that pretty much is all of the calibration frames. So ideally, when you are done at the end of a night's imaging session, what you want to end up with are 30 images of whatever it is that you are imaging. So let's say you're working on the North American Nebula and you took 30 images at three minutes each. Then you're going to have your 30 dark frames that are also three minutes each. And then you're going to have 30 flat dark frames or 30 to 100 bias frames. And then finally, you're going to have 30 flat frames. So you're essentially ending up with uh, four different sets of data, lights, darks, flats, and bias or flat darks. And what you can do with these is when you copy them off of your camera or your ASI Air or whatever you are using to acquire your data, you can actually load them into folders that are named just that way. So for example, when I am bringing in all of my astrophotography data, I will make a folder that is the name of the target that I'm going for. So let's say Horsehead Nebula. And then within that, I will have four different folders, one called lights, one called darks, one called flats, and one called flat darks. And then I will just drop all of that data into each appropriate folder. And the good news is if you're using uh, something like Nina or the ASI Air, it actually asks you what kind of frame you are taking before you take it. So for example, in the ASI Air, when you're setting up a plan, it'll ask, actually ask you if you're taking a light, a dark, or a flat. And if you select that properly, whenever you go to import that into whatever software you are using, uh, for example, if you were using Pix Insight and you were using the weighted batch pre-processing tool, uh, the fits header, which is the uh, fits file type, and then the header is the data written in the header of the file, will actually tell the software exactly what type of file it is and then automatically put it in the correct area for you and then begin stacking those frames when you tell it to. So it can save you a whole lot of time having to rename files and putting them in specific areas uh, within your astronomy processing uh, software. So it's it's quite a nice time saver and um, it's definitely the ideal way to do things. Now, if you forgot and you accidentally, uh, let's say you put your lens cap on and you kept telling it that you were taking lights, that's perfectly fine. You can still use those as darks. You don't need to rename them all. You just want to make sure that you select the correct frames uh, when you're importing them into your stacking software and put them in the appropriate area. So don't worry about it if you, you know, messed up and I don't know, took a uh, bias frames and you had it set to the light profile on whatever your acquisition software is it's still going to work perfectly fine. As long as you exposed it correctly and, you know, had your cap on, if you were taking darks, um, it's just that the name's not going to work the same, but that's okay. You can manually correct that yourself. Uh, by putting it in the appropriate folders. So we just talked for quite a long while about calibration frames. And I just want to tell you guys, the last couple weeks I've been imaging and I've been doing it on really clean glass. So I took a, you know, little bit of time after I got back from our dark skies trip and I sat down and cleaned all of my gear and I haven't used calibration frames for a few weeks now just to kind of see what the results would be like. And I was kind of shocked at how good they came out. So I am, I just captured, as I said, new dark frames this morning and I got flats in bias frame or flat darks for, excuse me, uh, the North American Nebula last night. So I'm going to go ahead and process that one probably after I finish recording tonight and uh, just see how much different it looks and how much better it comes out. I will tell you that I was uh, very much minimizing vignetting because I had the lens stopped down a little bit. Um, when I say stop down a lens, I mean reducing it from F2 down to 
f3.5 so stop down a couple clicks and that reduces the vignetting um and i also again i had very very clean glass so i knew there wasn't going to be a dust issue when i went to go uh work on my images now if i was imaging i don't know somewhere where i had very little control over my environment I would absolutely take flat frames. And the example I'm giving is like, if I was taking a dark sky trip, you'd be crazy not to take flat frames in that situation because you don't know if you're gonna have, you know, perfectly dust-free glass until you get home and look at the files. Um, and the last thing you wanna do is take a trip out somewhere to gather data specifically, and then get all the way back home and find out that there's dust on your photos. So even though I'm sitting here saying that, you know, Maybe it's not as important as some people make it out to be. I am still absolutely in the camp of you should take flats, darks, and bias uh, whenever you absolutely can. So, all right, that's pretty much it this week for calibration frames. I did have one thing I wanted to talk about that I saw in the news for astronomy, which is a uh, quite sad news as far as I'm concerned. I actually read that Mead and Orion telescopes have actually stopped business. So it looks like a uh, sky and telescope magazine actually reported on this last week. Um, if you don't know Mead and Orion are pretty much legends in the telescope game. If you ever saw a telescope in the eighties or nineties, um, chances are it was a Mead or an Orion. Um, before Celestron came along, um, Mead and Orion were pretty much the kings of astronomy. And they have had their offices out in California um, for pretty much as long as they've been around, from what I understand. Now, they're actually, uh, their actual processing plant was down in Tijuana, Mexico. Um, and that's where they've been producing, you know, their telescopes and electronics. Um, but yeah, for five decades, Mead was one of the world's biggest manufacturers of telescopes for astronomers. So they are, a, you know, an absolute legend in astronomy. And I, I just hate to hear that they're, uh, they're, they're shutting down. Um, it sounds like on Tuesday, July 9th, uh, all of the staff were let go at the end of the business day. And um, it's unclear whether they are going to pursue bankruptcy protection. So um, their websites are still up. So, you know, their shipping is apparently still going on. I did check and I was able to bring up Orion's website. No problem. Um, so read into that what you will. I personally am just reading into it that they probably still have someone shipping out telescopes as long as someone's sending them money, which you can't blame them for if they're going bankrupt. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, definitely the end of an era, um, without Mead and Orion being around anymore. It's going to be weird, um, not seeing new Orion gear getting made. I mean, even up until, you know, as of now, they still are, you know, making great telescopes, the Mead LX series, which you, I'm sure you've seen there, the big blue telescopes on the fork arms, those are, you know, legendary telescopes that a ton of astronomers and astrophotographers still use to this day. Uh, Orion is still making a lot of Dobsonian telescopes. Um, whenever I was first getting into astronomy, I almost bought an Orion Dob, an eight inch Dobsonian. And, uh, you know, for people who want to get into visual astronomy, it's kind of hard to recommend anything but a Dobsonian and, uh, you know, they made great ones for a very, very long time. And, uh, they actually kind of had the Schmidt Cassegrain, uh, on lockdown long before Celestron even came around. Um, so they are definitely going to be missed. Um, it's kind of unclear what the future holds for them at this point. It could be a situation where a different manufacturer ends up buying the naming rights and then, you know, builds telescopes in China or wherever they decide to build them and then just slaps the Orion or Mead name on them. Um, that's just speculation, though. I don't know what's actually, if anything, going to end up happening. I can't imagine that the name disappears entirely 
I mean, I suppose it's possible, but you would think that one of the manufacturers, like maybe your SV Boney or somebody who produces, you know, good but lower cost gear and astronomy would want to be able to, you know, buy the naming rights to that to maybe start calling their scopes Orion or Mead instruments. Um, but I guess we'll have to wait and see um, what the future holds for them. But I certainly wish all of the employees um, that have terribly lost their jobs just the absolute best of luck. Um, and I hope that you guys can land on your feet wherever you end up. All right, I am going to do a recommendation this week. And I don't know if I've recommended this book in the past. Um, I don't think that I have, but I can't swear to it because I have done over 20 different recommendations and the vast majority of them are books. Uh, this is not an astronomy related book, but it is a wildlife related book, um, which if you know me, you know that I am very much a person who loves wildlife and just the science behind them. And in this case, the, uh, the book is called Remarkably Bright Creatures, and it's by Shelby Van Pelt. It is, again, on Audible, like pretty much every book that I recommend is. Um, it's an incredible story. It's, it's not a long read. Um, you can get through it uh, relatively quickly. I think the audiobook's only about 11 hours long, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's just a phenomenal story. It's actually about an octopus named Marcel and basically the humans that he encounters throughout his lifetime, which is unfortunately very short compared to a human's lifetime. And he basically, without any spoilers, um, has a very large impact on these human beings lives, um, by, you know, essentially telling his own story. So, uh, the audiobook version of this is actually really great because, there are two different voice actors. One is doing pretty much all of the characters and they're extremely talented. Um, and then the other is specifically doing Marcel's voice, um, which I love because he has such a unique um, voice and you just kind of, you can't hear anything else besides that when you think of Marcel after you listen to the audio book. So if you want to hear a great story, uh, that is definitely my recommendation for this week. Um, my wife actually just finished reading it and she absolutely loved it. My mother-in-law loved it. So, you know, whether you're a man, a woman or anything in between, um, I think that you would definitely enjoy this story. So that one is going to do it for my recommendation. I want to give a shout out to my wife about one other thing too. She actually surprised me today with the Lego Milky Way set, which is absolutely incredible if you have not seen it. I'm a, a big fan of Lego. I actually pretty much have all of their uh, space sets. Well, not all of them because they do have a lot of space sets, but I've got pretty much all the ones that I want to have at this point. Uh, short of the, they came out with a new rocket recently. I want to say it's the Artemis rocket. I could be getting that wrong. Uh, but anyway, uh, the Milky Way is, it's beautiful. It's like over 3000 pieces. So it is a very large set. Um, so, uh, it basically ends up looking like a painting of the Milky Way spiral galaxy. So if you want to check that out, you can get that at Amazon or Lego.com. Or if you're lucky enough to live near a Lego store, you could probably pick it up there as well. Um, if that's something you're interested in, I know that it's also, uh, split into several different pieces basically. So you can build it with friends or you can build one section a night. And, uh, I'm really looking forward to building that and then hanging it on the wall because it is indeed something to be hung on the wall. And there's even, I was looking at the box and it looks like there's a little, you are here placard that shows you exactly you know, where you are in the Milky Way or where we are, I should say. And uh, I even think there's a little satellite on the outside. I can't be sure, but I assume it's the Voyager space probe because it's just past to the edge of the Milky Way. Um, I'm sure I'll find out in the book when I'm reading about it. If you've ever bought one of the larger uh, Lego sets that's more of the adult driven ones, they oftentimes come with a book that tells you all about the particular set. Uh, one of my favorites was when I built the uh, Apollo rocket um, for the lunar landings, um, the Saturn V rather, uh, for the Apollo program. 
And uh, it actually had a ton of awesome info in it, as well as the Lunar Lander, which was a really cool set. So I better shut up, though, because those could be recommendations for another week. <laughs> um, but all that being said, guys, I think that's uh, just about going to do it for us this week. I really, really greatly appreciate everybody tuning in. I want to once again thank our Patreon members, including David, who is our newest member of the Patreon. Thank you so much, David, for joining. We will be back next week with a new episode, and I will do my best to have it in video. Thank you so much for listening to the Astrocast. I'm your host, Rue. Clear skies.